all appreciated that beautiful, I want to say, rendition of This Is My Father's World. Yeah, great song for this day. Well, yeah, I'm getting a guess. And uh, I had to bring up some coffee up here because um, Dan did such, no, I got some. I did such a great job. Sometimes Dan makes the coffee, it depends on who comes in here, but Dan, you made an excellent word. Oh, there you go, yeah. That is such good coffee. I thought, I had a couple of sips and I thought, I've got to take this up with me, so. Oh, no, I won't spill <laughs> You know, that's, that's for all you folks that are sitting on those chairs up there. There has to be some perks to being the pastor. I'm the boss, applesauce, as uh, Judge Judy says, you know. No, oh, that's, uh, yes. Well, next week you don't want to miss because you're going to see a very timely, incredible presentation uh, by a man named Cy Rogers. It's going to be a DVD. Probably have a little shorter worship because it's an hour teaching. And um, he's incredible. He was scheduled to have a sex change operation. Uh, stood uh, for two men at the first gay wedding in Hawaii, way back, I think, in the 1970s, and um, came out of that. And is, has a worldwide ministry. It, you, he is funny. He is poignant. And you'll just really, it'll, it'll open your hearts and open your eyes to the power of God. With men, it is impossible, but not with God. With God, Jesus says, all things are possible. So we're going to see a transformed transsexual next week. Today, we're going to talk about when you father a bother. Anybody ever fathered a bother? Well, we'll get into that. And uh, it's a joy to have you fathers with us. And you know, Father's Day, uh, fathers are so important. I... I don't normally listen to Joel Osteen. I, I put him on for a few minutes while he says, I like to start with something funny. And then I listen to the joke. And if it has any merit at all, I bring it here and share it with you. And if not, I just... But today he was, he was right on, just saying that we all need the blessing of a, of a father and how people's lives can be uh, affected if they don't have that father's blessing is his approval and fathers you know today we're being told otherwise but mothers are very important and so are fathers we need both fathers and mothers we don't all have that opportunity or blessing some of you uh, lost your fathers to death some of you uh, may have been raised in one single parent home because of divorce and and those are unfortunate situations but they're not the ideal we need that balance because fathers and mothers are, are very different and mothers generally uh, make the home. Uh, generally, they soften life, you know, moms do. And of course, Mother's Day, we just celebrated a few weeks ago, we shower our mothers, don't we, with gifts, and it's just a day with pink and carnations and flowers and gifts, and we just lavish. And then Father's Day kind of comes along, and it's kind of a second thought thing, you know. It's, it's uh, again, yeah, smaller gift, little card, you know, generally we don't take dad out to dinner as frequently. You know, the restaurants won't be jammed like they are on Mother's Day. They'll be grilling on a 111 degree day. Yeah, <laughs> poor dads. And But men are appreciated and they need to be appreciated. And the role of protector and the role of provider is very different from that of nurturer and comforter, as mothers are. Uh, dads are usually more playful than moms. I don't know about you, but my dad, I remember ancient memories of mine when I was just a toddler and I remember the house we were in and the living room and my dad my dad was always he was a professional man he was a, an optometrist and some of you that are old enough to remember the Dennis the Menace comics when you see Dennis's dad you'd always see these long uh, former formal trousers and a white shirt and a tie and that was the way I remember my dad and I remember him being down on all fours in that shirt and his tie and, and, and playing horsey with us in the living room. And I remember another time my mother went out for the evening, but it was rare when my parents worked together, but she had um, some women's clubs or something back in the 50s, early 60s. And my dad was home babysitting us and he was playing monster with us. <laughs> and he was walking through the house, you know, like Frankenstein's monster. And he kept turning the lights up because we were running and screaming you know, through the house and my sister and brother and I were running away. And my dad 
lost his teeth in the war. <laughs> he served in the Second World War. He claimed he didn't get to brush his teeth. And, you know, if you had a couple cavities in, in that day, they just yanked all your teeth out and in, you know, in went the dentures. So <laughs> I remember him making his face and sliding his dentures out. And, and I, mean, I knew it was, it was, is this my dad? It scared, scared me. Yeah. <laughs> But we had fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing what fun you can have. Uh, a guy by the name of Harmon Killebrew said this. My father used to play with my brother and me in the yard. Mother would come out and say, you're tearing up the grass. Dad would reply, we're not raising grass, we're raising boys. <laughs> Somebody else said a father carries pictures where his money used to be. Uh, Dad, my da dads embarrass us different times. You know, my dad used to embarrass me with, he, he carried those pictures in the wallet. When we were adults, when my sister and brother and I were performing and had an act, my dad would, uh, we'd see him after the show if he was in town, and he'd be standing outside the showroom talking to people we didn't know and showing them this, all these pictures in plastic, yeah. And here, there, 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 yeah. And it was really horrible, I mean, it was in my 40s, and probably 50s, and he'd be with some celebrity who'd be working with Alan King or, or Rich Little or somebody, and he'd be showing them these pictures like you can impress them with what we did, you know. It embarrassed me, but you know, it's a wonderful memory now. <laughs> Hank Williams Jr. said, My daddy was somewhere between God and John Wayne. Oh, yeah. Well, my dad was somewhere between God and Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> he was funny. And I have shared this story a number of times, but um, it's my favorite story about my dad as I was growing up. It's so personal. I was about 11 years old. I was in seventh grade. I played trumpet from fifth grade till about eighth grade, and I was a good little trumpet player. And I remember one Saturday afternoon uh, during the school year, I was up in my bedroom, and I know I had to be really, really young because I was sitting on the edge of my bed practicing my trumpet with no back, you know, to the, so you know you've got to really be a kid because no adult would sit and not have you know back on the thing. And there was my there was my music on the music stand and I was playing away. And I guess a little while into the rehearsal, the practice, I looked beyond the bell of my trumpet and onto the music and beyond the stand. And there was my desk and there was a whole copper uh, mug filled with pencils that I did my homework with. And being the aeronautic expert that I was at 11 and still am today, I thought, well, what would that be like if I just blew one of those pencils out of my trumpet? Yeah, I, mean, I, that's, I should be able to shoot one of those just by blowing. So I took one of the pencils and I put it in the bell of my horn and I blew with all my might and nothing happened. And then I wrote, oh, of course, you know, what I need, I need more substance to this. It needs to be more like a rocket. So I took, got two other pencils and I ran from my upstairs bedroom down to the kitchen where my mother was busy with something. I went to our junk drawer and I got some gum bands. That's Pittsburgh East for a rubber band. And I wrapped the gum bands or the rubber band around these pencils fastened together, put those in the bell of my horn, and blew with all my mind. And nothing happened. So at that I re realized that the experiment was a failure. And, you know, that was it. So I went to take those pencils with the gum bend around it other than my trumpet and they were stuck in there. So I thought, okay, I will have to get them out. And they weren't pulling out, so I will float them out. I went into the bathroom and I ran water through the trumpet. Now, before you all panic, when you have a brass instrument, you do clean them out with brushes and stuff and you can run water through it. So I thought the water will just run those pencils right out. And I ran water through the horn and that didn't budge them. I think all it did was warp them. So now I realize that I had to get some sort of an instrument or tool to help me out. And I went back down to the kitchen, went back to that same drunk junk drawer, or drunk drawer, and uh, drunk drawer, and I <laughs> found a pair of pliers, ran back upstairs, sat down on my bed again, put the mouthpiece of my trumpet between my knees to secure it, the bell was up here. I took those pliers and I pulled with all my might and the pencils came out, hallelujah. And then I took the trumpet back up in my arms and to my horror, I realized that I had pulled the whole trumpet apart. Oh no. 
the mouthpiece was going this way, the bell of the horn was going this way. It was like an Egyptian hieroglyphic. And just as I was going through this panic, like, what am I going to do? Oh, what have I done? My bedroom door opened up and my mother stood there. I don't know how mothers know their kids are up to something. And I just remember in my, my memory was just, she stood there and lectured me with one, like peanuts cartoon, wah, 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 wah. and she said, wait till your dad gets home. And she closed the door and I sat there with this trumpet going all kinds of directions and just devastated. How could I have been so stupid? How could I have done this? Now my dad was working and he never, I never remember my dad really hitting me for anything. My dad was not a disciplinarian, but I was scared. I, I had no idea what he was gonna do with what I had just done. And I suffered through that afternoon. And then late in the afternoon or early in the evening, I heard the car come up the driveway and I heard my dad opening the garage door and I heard the car pull into the garage and I heard the door open from the garage to the house. And then I heard my parents having this discussion. <laughs> my heart was pounding. And then I began to hear these heavy footsteps coming up. All 13 of our steps. And then the door opened and my dad, who was six foot one, tall, fairly slender, looked bigger and taller than I ever remember him. And he came toward my bed and I was in tears at this point and he sat beside me, put his arm around me and he said, I know you didn't mean to do this. How did he know? <laughs> and then he said your mother and I know that you have suffered all afternoon you've gone through enough punishment come on downstairs and have dinner <sighs> grace yes. it's so much like our father in heaven Tom Wolfe in his novel The Bonfire of the Vanities wrote this Sherman made the terrible discovery that men make about their fathers sooner or later. That the man before him was not an aging father, but a boy. A boy much like himself. A boy who grew up and had a child of his own. And as best he could, out of a sense of duty and perhaps love, adopted a role called being a father. So that his child would have something mythical and infinitely important. A protector that would keep a lid on all the chaotic and catastrophic possibilities of life. We're going to see today that even better than any earthly father, our heavenly father is also a protector. And he is faithful to love and to care for us, even when we ourselves create the chaos and the catastrophes. Abram and Sarah Sarai at that time did something a lot more catastrophic than trying to blow a couple of pencils out the bell of a trumpet. They got impatient with God and they, as many of you know, that know your Bibles, they decided to help God out with his promise that they were going to have a child, a son. And they decided to rush Father's Day and they fathered a bother. Let's look at some scripture. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn with me and read in your Bibles or mark them in some way or just note, uh, we're going to Genesis chapter 15. And we're going to look at a few verses here. Chapter 15 of Genesis begins in, chapter, in verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Stephanie and I were just praying about that scripture this morning. God told Abraham, I am your very great reward. And one of the things we learn as we come into an intimate relationship with God is, is that's true for every one of us. Of all the gifts we gain from him, he is the reward. He's the reward. Verse 2, but Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. 
And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look at the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed God and he credited it to him as righteousness. And every one of us in here who have believed God have gained righteousness through our belief, through our faith, as he promised Abraham. Now, we are going to see that God continuously promises Abraham, his name was changed eventually from Abram to Abraham, that he is going to be the father of a child his own child, and his wife. Now, Abram, at this time when God tells him this, he's 75 years old, which even in Bible days was old. And his wife was past menopause. She'd never had a child. And now it was too late by human standards for her to have a child. And God says, she's going to be changing diapers. Yeah. So God continually tells them they're going to have a son. And God's timing is so different than your timing and my timing. God never seems to be in a big hurry. <laughs> and I'll tell you one good thing about living six plus decades and walking with God four plus decades is I've learned <laughs> that anything that God's going to do, He generally doesn't do overnight. You know, doesn't do overnight. Thank God I've learned that. It changes your whole outlook on life. I like what Joyce Meyer says. She says, talks about when we have to just wait. She says, what better thing do you have to do? You know, and if you really think about it, isn't that the truth? I mean, just have to be here anywhere and live away anyway and uh, live life. And then we start in uh, chapter 16, verse 1. We read this. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, <laughs> you got to understand when Sarah came up with this plan, it's, it's sort of like that plan I had to blow pencils on a trumpet. You know, you come up with, get a little plan in your head. When she had this plan, They've been waiting for 10 years. He was 75 when God said, you're going to have a child. And now he's 85. Where's the kid? <laughs> Nowhere. So Sarai comes up with a reasonable plan. This was common practice at this time. Everybody did it that didn't have children. They just got a surrogate mommy. Those don't always work out. If you ever read the papers, a lot of times you see these legal things going on with somebody who hires somebody to bear a child. But anyway, this is a servant, so she's got no voice in this thing. Common legal practice, it makes good common sense. Everybody does it. Except God has been promising Abram and Sarai that he's going to give them a child. Supernaturally. God's ways are higher than our ways. He has holy standards. That's where we get into trouble. We figure, oh, it's not working out as fast as I think it should, so I'm going to I'm going to come up with plan B. Plan B will get you into trouble. You're going to end up fathering a bother. So, again, maybe everybody else is having children this way. But God's spoken something to these two people. You know there are only two kinds of people in the world. The redeemed and the unredeemed. And the thing that makes Christianity so different from what's going on out there. If we're really walking by God's standards. Is that we're redeemed. And the standards are different and the rules have changed. And that's why there are so many things going on in our culture that seem to make sense, that we can sympathize with, that we can gain understanding, but they're not God's ways. So we pick up in verse 2 here. His wife just comes up with this plan, and we read, Abram agreed to what Sarai said. 
So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to his hus her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. I can just see Hagar's high school yearbook. Voted most likely to conceive. <laughs> Sarai has trouble believing God's promises. And then Abraham, Abram goes right along with her. What's that sound like? Adam and Eve, exactly. Eve was in the garden. The serpent spoke to Eve. The serpent kind of explained things that uh, God's just telling you this because if you, if you eat of that tree, you'll be just like he is. And she eats of the apple and then she talks her passive husband into it. And Abram's doing the same thing. Passivity. If we're going to live a, live a successful Christian life, people, we need to be aggressive. We've lost prayer in school because Christians weren't aggressive. We've lost the Bible in school because Christians weren't aggressive. We've let the Supreme Court, people who are not voted in but nominated to make a decision that it's okay for people to slaughter their babies. And the Christians stayed silent and passive. And we are living in a culture that's largely our fault. You can't just float along. I don't know how many of you go to uh, Wet n' Wild. But Stephanie, thank God, she gets me a season pass every year. And it makes me survive the summers. And they have a lazy river there. You get in this thing that goes around the circle waterway. And there's a current. And you just get in there and you get on an inner tube or something and you just float along with all these other bodies in there. Just float and float. And that's not Christianity. We are never meant to just float along and just let things go on in our lives. You hear people say, I never meant to get addicted to internet porn. I never meant to have an affair. Just, honestly, when it started, but Joseph ran away from Potiphar's wife and had every reason why he should have been a reasonable man would have gone to bed with her. 1 Corinthians 6.18, it tells us to flee from sexual immorality. That means run from it. That's action. We don't just sit down and have another cup of coffee with the office turn on, you know, when we're married. Setting ourselves up for sin. So Hagar is Pragar. Or Pragers. <laughs> and we'll see here that there's a price to pay when we do things out of faith and do them our own way. Verse 4 of Genesis 16. Hagar, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. You know, that takes some guts when you are a servant in those days. You're a slave. And you get pregnant by the your mistress's husband. And now you start to show a little bit of sassiness. Then Sarah said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms and now she knows she is pregnant. Now that she knows she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Hmm. This, people, is only the beginning of heartache. The kid's not even here yet. The baby's not even born. And they've already got trouble. Trouble, 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 trouble. Man. Men who have had affairs. You know, everything seems good in the beginning. <laughs> That's the devil's way. He just knows how to make it look so good. Even if it's something more minor, like that cupcake when you're on a diet, you know. <laughs> And, of course, things can get a lot worse. I, when I first came to town, I was 21 years old. My sister was 18. My brother was 23. Very young. And uh, a, a, an older couple in the church, middle-aged couple, befriended us and dubbed themselves our West Coast parents. My parents were back in Pittsburgh, and this was our first jaunt away from home. And we go to their house for dinner, and we became friends. And they had a son about our age who no longer was at home. He was in his early 20s. And they also had a mentally childless son, a Down syndrome boy, who was about 12. And if you got to know them, they shared their story. And that is that after they'd been married quite a number of years, 
Daryl, the husband, decided to winky winky at a girl that worked at the office. Now the red flags always come up. She had been with every man at the office. And now it was his turn. So they get involved. And if that's not bad enough, he decides that he's going to trade in all his years of marriage and leave his wife and his son, who is special needs, for this, what they used to call, floozy. <laughs> Term's gone out of practice, but it's good to dust them off once in a while and bring them back out. We well, can imagine what this did for her, his wife, who had this special needs child who was hurting inside, but she threw herself into the family of God at the church, and she just clung to the Lord. And uh, her husband had moved in with the babe from the office. And then one night out of the blue, he came back home in tears and repentant and left the mistress and said, I was wrong. Will you take me back? And, and did what he should have done. And that's wonderful when people repent. However, it did not change the circumstances. We, we suffer consequences. Well, the mistress decided to make good on her promise that if he left her, she would commit suicide. So she swallowed a bottle of pills. And the next thing you know, both Daryl and his wife are standing by her bed. She's in a coma with the sister of the mistress. It's very complicated. And the woman died. Thank God their marriage stayed together, but you live with these consequences. You know, she would have, I'm sure, taken her own life with some other man, but wouldn't it have been better if it were not Daryl? So they fathered a bother, and sin will complicate your life. We don't want to add to our sin like Sarai, who blames her husband. Yeah, you're the reason. She, she came up with a plot. Do this, here's my maidservant. And then she blames him when things get sticky and ugly. Verse 6. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. And Sarai mistreated Hagar. So she fled from her. It's a good thing to do to a pregnant woman. This is the mother of our faith, people. Gives us hope. <laughs> she mistreats Hagar. Hagar flees. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. God makes Hagar, who really is a victim here, except she really shouldn't have taken an attitude with her mistress, with her boss. <laughs> but she was just kind of a hopeless and helpless ploy. But the angel makes Hagar go back and face the problem. You know what? Running away or hiding from any issue in our life never works. Never works. Even women that have been in abusive relationships need to get away from the abuser, but they still have to face what makes them go into these situations, as, as any of us do. And any kind of thing always amazes me. I think of somebody I know that was, uh, they were having marital problems and she left him and they've been married like 16 years. And then I found out that she'd been married two other times, or three other times before that marriage. So four marriages, you know. And in those kind of situations, you have to look at yourself and say, let me see what is the common denominator in every one of these marriages. Uh, uh, that would be uh, me. Yeah. In John 8, 32, Jesus said, You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And the truth is facing truth, even by ourselves. 
We have to face the truth. How did I get into this mess? I was trying to do that 11 years old. How did I get into this mess of messing up the trumpet? Verse 10. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now with child and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. That sounds like a good time on the horizon. <laughs> She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Bir Lahoi Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar, in spite of it, God brings blessing out of this whole mess. Just like my Broken, broken trumpet. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a whole mess, and, and God steps in. Would have been better if they hadn't messed things up, because there'll be a price to pay. But it gives us assurance of what God reassures us in the New Testament. Romans 8:28. For we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. You know, that is that's really a faith statement. Because when you lose a job and things just look hopeless, if you stand on that, God, I don't have, you don't have to understand it. You know, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Most of our life, we, we, we don't get answers to. You know, we don't understand, but we trust in Him. And God says that everything that goes on in your life, He'll work for good. God's going to bless both Hagar and Ishmael. Sarai and Abram, in spite of the fact that they've messed things up, are still going to have a son, but they still father to bother. Look again at Genesis 16, 12. He will be a wild donkey of a man. This is Abraham's son, one of his sons. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers and there's been turbulence in the Middle East ever since. Every one of us can relate to not trusting God and getting into some sort of sin and creating a mess. I, I doubt that there's one person in this room that can say, I don't have any regrets. <laughs> I've done everything right. <laughs> but I'll tell you, there's a good thing about fathering a bother, and I found this from personal experience. You come up with this change in attitude, and it's like, I've been there, I've gone through that, and I don't think I ever want to do that again. I know I never messed up another musical instrument again in my life. <laughs> Just did that once. <laughs> you learn. Alex Haley and I don't think this is original with him, but he's given credit for saying, unless we learn from history, we are destined to repeat it. You know, there's nothing worse than seeing people, and it's usually easier for us to see other people who haven't learned, you know? I can think of a friend of mine, great, great comedian, played at the dunes, traveled all over the world with Liberace, made great money, ended up at one point owing the IRS $30,000. You know, if you owe a friend $30,000, you owe a family member $30,000, that's, that's not a great thing, but you don't want to owe the IRS $30,000. So she had all kinds of problems, and she got, she was out of work, and then she started working again, and she got some money again, and she paid the IRS off. Thank God, all free and clear. And she continued to work and make money. And then she owed the IRS money again. <laughs> and she declared bankruptcy twice. It's like, you know, after you do that once, uh, you know, and you know, this wasn't a young woman. Man, Christians who deliberately marry non-Christians, oh, no, against everybody's warnings. Oh, it's going to work because we love each other. We just love each other. Hmm. 
Joel 3, 25 and 26 says this. What a promise. I'm going to read from the King James. I like it. This translation. I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I send against you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. God promises us that when we screw up royally, if we'll submit to Him, He'll restore. He'll restore the years. I'm a testimony, people, of God restoring a whole chunk of years. A whole chunk of years. Yeah, once in a while I have regrets. I try not to live in the regrets, but you know, you have your memory and you think, ooh. But God is faithful. And I love the way it says that he, that he hath dealt wondrously with us. Wondrously. You know what happened with my trumpet? My parents took it, this thing, this thing, they took it, it looked like Picasso had painted it when I finished it. And my parents took it over to a guy named Stanley Paul who had a little shop in Arnold where, that repaired instruments. And he soldered it back together. And, you know, it was workable again. Yeah. But my parents also reasoned it was a second-hand trumpet when they bought it. My brother played it before me, and it had some dings in it anyway. So they bought me a brand new trumpet. Oh, it was the most beautiful trumpet I've ever seen. It was a York trumpet. And it had brass fixtures, and there was silver on it. And there was gold in other places and copper. And it was just beautiful and it played beautifully. And you just go, wow. All that because I tried to blow some pencils. <laughs> and you know, that example with my own dad is, is just the way God deals with us. You know, you would think that would spoil me. And I wouldn't learn from screwing up and then gaining a reward. But you know... The Bible tells us that God's kindness leads us to repentance. Sometimes we think that God needs to be over us with a whip to, to keep us in line. But I'll tell you, when, when we enter that love relationship, that love of God. And I'll tell you, I stand here because that's the way it was in my life. I loved God and I was tired of letting Him down. I was tired of not living His way. And I've been greatly blessed. And that's what God does. And he promises again to restore if we stop birthing Ishmael's. But that's the whole thing. We have to learn to, to stop. We have to learn to stop. And I don't know why it takes some of us so long. I, I don't get it. I just keep praying in certain circumstances. God, I pray that they'll wake up. Stop fathering fathers. Stop doing, pardon the expression, stupid things. I want to close with as we think of fathers, fatherhood this is something I don't too often quote Sigmund Freud as I remember or as I remember referring to him in junior high school Freud remember that? reading about Socrates and Freud <laughs> Sigmund Freud said I cannot think of any need as strong as a need for a father's protection. That's Freud, people. That sounds biblical. My dad was not a forceful, domineering man. But my dad was always a protector. And my dad would have done anything for any one of his children. You know, that's a real blessing when you have that in your life. I don't know why I was so blessed that I had a father and a mother that I could look at with honor and gratitude all through my days, even though they're now in heaven. Every good thing that I have is because of, of, of them, and I thank God for them. Always a protector. And my dad's example way back there, as an 11-year-old messing up with trumpet, is such a beautiful example of the love of our Father in heaven who loves us, demonstrates grace to us, restores us, sets us back where we need to be. Let's close in prayer.
Lord, some of us in this room have had wonderful fathers, fathers who affirmed them, fathers that they knew well. Others never may have even met their biological fathers. Some knew their fathers for a while and maybe then were raised with a stepfather who stepped in to fill their dad's shoes. Lord, whatever the situation is, regardless of how good our daddies are, even Jesus spoke to fathers and said, if you be evil, meaning just broken and sinful people, if, if you being imperfect would do this for your children, how much more your Father in heaven? Lord, the cry of our hearts today is that we come into closer relationship with you, Abba, Father, Daddy in heaven. And so, Father, I pray to you as you draw us closer to you and help us to recognize you as provider, as protector, as the Father who never will leave us or abandon us, even if our earthly parents should turn their faces from us. I ask, Father, that you fill the void in any of our lives, Father, that our own daddies have left. Father, that we recognize you as a God of all substance, our all in all, our great hope. Thank you, Lord, for our dads. Thank you for each dad in this place. Thank you for each man in this place. Lord, help us to live as men who stand up and represent our Father in heaven. Bless each one in this place, Father. Thank you for this day. Thank you for a good service. Send us out with your joy and peace. We ask this again in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 If any of you need prayer, uh, I'll be up here. Uh, Pastor George is here available for prayer and uh, Rick Davis. So uh, any needs, please bring them forth. Otherwise, have a great day. We've got a wonderful